everyone. It's, it's really been a pleasure for me to be here this year. Now, some of you all come here every year, so you're kind of used to being here. For me, this is my first time on, this, uh, on these hallowed grounds. And for both my son and myself, this has really been a blessing. So thank you very much for uh, providing a camp meeting experience that has really watered my soul. And what a pleasure, you know, what a joy to have the King's Heralds here, to hear Don and Joel and Russell and Jeff. That's not every day you have that, and, uh, and that's great. You know, since I've been here, I even met a dear soul, one of the ministerial staff of this conference, who warmed my heart by telling me what a fan he was of Marmite. Does anybody understand Marmite? Anybody? You know Marmite? Well, what about that? If, if, if you don't, Marmite is a, it's really a New Zealand institution and Australia, I guess, fair to say. Marmite is produced by the Sanitarium Health Food Company, which is a Seventh-day Adventist run health food company. And uh, in New Zealand, we feed Marmite to our children to make sure they grow up to be big and strong. That's what we do. It's a spread that you put on uh, toast or bread or you mix it in with the baby's milk when you give the baby the bottle. I think they did it, I think they did it in our house. When uh, Pastor Kleindon told me that he's a Marmite man, I said, there is a man who is close to God. That's what I said. <laughs> close to God. One of the most, uh, you can probably buy it in the United States, Marmite or its cousin Vegemite, they're rather similar. You can probably buy it in the United States. I just bring mine back with me from New Zealand when I go. As a matter of fact, I was, uh, where was I? I think I was in, it was, was, did it happen in Daytona Beach? Was it Charlotte, North Carolina? It was somewhere. And I got on, a, I was checking, uh, get, get, going to get on a plane. This stuff is Understand, I left New Zealand 20 years ago, you know, and so Marmite is there and I am here, and it makes life rather desperate at times if I don't have a supply of um, Marmite or Vegemite on hand. And it's, a, it's, a, it's not a paste, it's not a cream, it's, a, it's spreadable. Uh, it's, it's, it's a spreadable thing. It's, 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 how, do you, how would you describe its consistency? Like, kind of, kind of like peanut butter. Oh, that's a horrible thing to say about it, but it's kind of like peanut butter. You just get it and you just spread it, you know. And I had some in my carry-on luggage. And I was going through security. They unzipped my bag. They said, what is this? I said, doesn't everybody know? It's Vegemite. They said, you can't take that through. I said, well, I can't get on the plane then. I can't leave the Vegemite behind. It's important stuff. One of the most wonderful things about my wife is that she just, just loathes Vegemite or Marmite. God bless her. I don't have to share it with her, you know? <laughs> So, you know, I'm a long way from my home in, where I live in Southern California uh, for now. I must tell you about that in a moment. Then I'm a long, long way from New Zealand, but to run into a man with a, with a, with a, a, true, a, a, a true heart, a Marmite heart. You know, the, there was an earthquake in New Zealand, and the factory that produces Marmite went offline, and the, and the supply was running out. People were selling this stuff on New Zealand's equivalent of eBay for like $100 or $200 a jar. They were calling the Marmite shortage Marmageddon. How about that? <laughs> yeah. So it's just been awesome to come here and talk Marmite with somebody who really knows and understands. Actually, I mentioned California. Um, I, I don't know if you know, but It Is Written uh, is now in relocation mode because the uh, North American division is selling the building in which we are housed. They're selling the Adventist Media Center, so we're going to be homeless until we find a new home. And so... I was at a place, I, I, I guess I ought not name it, I was at a place speaking to a group of people just like this, not nearly as intelligent and good looking, but, but just like this. And I said, you know, one of the most, one of the great things about California is the weather. The weather's just wonderful. One of the great things is the weather. I said, we only have two seasons, good and better. And, it, and so I said, the weather, the weather. And I ran into a lady afterward and she said, what was that you said about California? I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I heard you say one of the great things about California is the women. <laughs> I thought, well, 
I mean, uh, the two most wonderful women in the world live there, my wife and my daughter, but I mean, apart from that. And her sister-in-law turned around and said, I heard the same thing. So I, I hope that when you tell your camp meeting stories when you go back, you don't drop me in the soup by saying stuff like that, you know. Because that, that's not going to be good for anybody if word gets out that I said something like that. That's going to be a challenge. Um, yes, I mentioned it, it is written as relocating. Uh, but nothing's changing about the ministry other than our address, and we don't know where we're going or when exactly we're going, but we know that we've got to go, and so we're starting to, to, to look, look at going. Um, I would, yeah, I would... Well, I would say this too. Now, this is a rather serious note. Let me, let me say this. Some of you have heard, because you've spoken to me, and you've heard that uh, Pastor Mark Finley is very ill. Have many of you heard that? Have many of you not heard that? Okay, well, you're going to hear that. And uh, I, I think it's fair for me to say this to you. Um, and that is that he is not nearly as ill as people once thought he was. I got a phone call from somebody who said, did you hear Mark Finley has four years left to live? What? Oh, yeah, there's this going on and that going on. He's, it's no good. So I said, well, we'd better go to the source. And uh, what we found out is that what Elder Finley is wrestling with is something that's very treatable and sh should. I, 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 I can't make any promises, obviously. But they say is gonna, he, was, he is going to respond very well to treatment. So when you hear that he has cancer, that's not quite accurate. He has a precondition, uh, the presence of cancer cells, but he doesn't even have stage one cancer. It's not even that far along. And the word is that what he has is very treatable and he's going to be okay. So can't you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Yeah. But I, I want to share that with you because I know what will happen. The word gets around and then it gets out to the churches and then it really gets around. And before long, the funeral is on this week when Pastor Finley's really doing rather okay. So, so that, I'm not saying that he's, he's not ill. He is. He's taking a number of months out just to rest and, and so on. But thank God he's really doing quite well. And I'm really, really thankful for that. Something we're doing at, at uh, It Is Written that's a lot of fun. There's a project called Eyes for India. Just wanted to tell you about that. There's been some talk about India this week. So uh, this kind of complements that. Um, in India, there are 15 million blind people, three quarters of which the blindness is either preventable or reversible. And it's been, I, I went over there to launch our Eyes for India project. What we're doing is providing cataract surgery for people who cannot see or who have severely impaired vision. And it's just remarkable to talk to somebody who can't see anything. And then two days later or three days later, the bandages are off and they can see and they're so thankful. You know what somebody said, and I, I, I'm reluctant to say this, but Im, Im, you know, imagine not being able to see and then being able to see. And, and people were saying to me, they were saying, you are like a God to us. Now, I, I remember those passages in the Bible where they wanted to offer sacrifices you know, to Peter and Silas and so on, whoever it was. And uh, so rather than say, why, thank you. You know, we can't go there. I say, no, no, this is God that's doing it. I had little or nothing to do with it. We're just coordinating this. You know, for $75, you can give the gift of sight. Isn't that amazing? If it was just the surgery, the number would even be lower than that. But we've provided Ruby Nelson Memorial Hospital with a bus so they can go out to the surrounding villages and bring him back to the hospital uh, with a surgical equipment, with a with, uh, books, Steps to Christ in both Punjabi and Hindi. Uh, Ruby Nelson Memorial Hospital is located in Punjab state, but they take this all over India. You know, it's really something. I visited um, Punjabi, uh, no, sorry, Sikh temple complexes. And the people at the Sikh temples welcomed us with open arms. In fact, we got there to do some filming. They were having what could best be described as an evangelistic series outside. Then if you've ever complained about loud music in church, you haven't heard a thing. Music was blasting. 
And we thought to ourselves, how are we going to be able to film with all of this noise? You know what they did? They said, who is that? Oh, the Christians? The people who are coming and helping us with our eyesight? They stopped everything. They came to us and they said, we understand you want to do some filming. We're just going to stop. Take as long as you need and when you're done, tell us and we'll start again. I thought about that, you know. I just imagined us holding an evangelistic series. Can you imagine that at St. Louis Central holding an evangelistic series, a big evangelistic series. But there was a Muslim group in the area, maybe on the church grounds doing some filming. And we said, oh, let's just stop the evangelistic series. So the Muslims or the Hindus or the Sikhs or the Buddhists can do their thing. I mean, hard to imagine, isn't it? But that's the reception the Christians are getting there because of what is happening with Eyes for India as people are getting the gift of eyesight. In a Hindu temple complex, the priest stood up before the people and he said, the Christians have come to help us with their magic. So, you know, we're not letting them call us gods. We're straightening that out. And, and as a matter of fact, the Sikhs believe in only one God. They're not like Hindus and the multiplicity of gods. Uh, and it's opening doors and opening hearts to Jesus. It's very, very exciting. So if you're thinking about giving somebody a gift, you know what you could give somebody? You could give somebody the gift of sight or perhaps give the gift of sight in the name of somebody. Depending on how you look at it, $75 is nothing. I mean, $75 is $75, but there aren't many people here who pay less than that a month for our cell phone service. That kind of money runs through our fingers at times. So anyhow, I just wanted you to know about it. You can go to our website, itiswritten.com, then you can find out uh, plenty more there about Eyes for India and some of the other things It Is Written is doing. If you're not following us on Facebook, please do. And you'll get updates from us. Uh, and, and Twitter, if you tweet, you could follow us on Twitter as well just to know what we're doing. Uh, and then I'm hoping that you will keep It Is Written in your prayers. You know, we go to various places around the world in the United States preaching. Here's what I found out. The preaching of the gospel is more effective when God's people are praying for the preaching of the gospel. That's what I've found. So if I can ask you as my special friend, please, to pray for the work of It Is Written. Every week, thousands upon thousands of people see our television program. We've got to pray that God will touch their hearts, that they'll respond and receive the materials and learn more about the Bible and get into Bible studies. This happens, you know. People show up in church. We had people turn up to our It Is Written partnership events. Hey, well, I don't think I know you. Uh, what brought you here? Well, you sent me a letter. I did? Yes, you did. I've been watching It Is Written television for a long time. I started supporting the ministry. I got the letters in the mail. Oh, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist yet, but I love It Is Written, and I'm glad to be here at the partnership weekend. Now, this is exciting stuff, exciting. And television gets to reach people, uh, as far as It Is Written is concerned, all over these United States. So thank you for your prayers that God would do something powerful uh, through the ministry of It Is Written. If you haven't stopped by our booth, please do. If you haven't picked up one of our free bags, it's all free stuff out there, then grab one. If you have two hands, grab two. We're happy to, to leave it with you in the hope that it'll be a blessing uh, to you. So have a look at the booth and see if there's something there for you. I'm sure there is. Let us pray and expect that God would bless us tonight. Father, we come to you again in the name of Jesus. In the quietness of this place, we ask that through a miracle of divine grace, you would connect our hearts with yours <clears throat> you have blessed us this weekend and this week and we pray Lord please do it again what we believe father is that there is power in your word we know that long ago you spoke and it was done you commanded and it stood fast we believe there is creative power in your word. Tonight, let that creative power be effective in our lives. 
Bless us, please, we pray, not selfishly, but that you would be glorified. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Mark Bell is what they call in England a super punter. Now, if you're English, you've been around many English men or women, you might know that a punter, it's a colloquialism, and it means in England a gambler, someone who takes a punt, someone who gambles. Mark Bell gambles for a living. He's pretty good. Most years, he earns around two million pounds. And the way the U.S. dollar is going, what's that? It's about 70 million dollars. No, it's about $3 million every year. And in England, gambling earnings are tax-free, and so he takes all of that home. He sits in his office at his computer hour after hour monitoring the events upon which he will bet. Uh, interestingly enough, in England, the top two sports for gambling are soccer and horse racing number three is tennis tennis is a sport that people bet on a lot he was monitoring the action at a certain tennis tournament when he saw something it's a few years ago the number four tennis player in the world was playing the number 87 tennis player in the world Number four, Nikolai Davidenko of Russia. Number 87, Vasayo Aguayo. Four versus 87. Who's going to win? No doubt. Uh, in tennis, upsets can happen, but the difference between four and 87 is about the same as the difference between four and 4,000. Outside the top 15, you don't really have a chance of beating the guys at the top if they're on their game. Mr. Bell noticed something. He noticed that lots of money was being wagered on number 87. He thought, this is strange. Why would that be? And he noticed, and somehow he was able to tell, that it was Russian money being bet on the Argentine. Remember, number four, Davidenko, is from Russia. And number 87, Aguayo, is from Argentina. The closer the tennis match got to start time, more and more money was being wagered on the underdog. And this is not normal, you understand. Normally, the favored player, in terms of rankings, would receive more attention than the unfavored player. The game began, and I don't know why you're even able to do this, but gambling was able to continue after the start of the game. And even though Mr. Davidenko, number four, was leading more money and large sums of it was being bet on number 87. Mr. Bell said, I've seen this before. Somebody knows something. You're not going to bet a pile of money on number 87 versus number four unless you know something. And so he took 50,000 pounds and wagered it on Mr. Arguello because he said, this is a sure thing. Even after Nikolai Davidenko won the first set, large sums of money were still being wagered on Mr. Arguello. Our friend Mr. Bell sat back and he said, there's no doubt, there is no doubt the underdog is going to win this game. It doesn't look like it's honest. But with all that money going on number 87 against number four, even one set into the game, somebody knows something. And he was right. In the third set of the game, Mr. Davidenko suddenly seemed to become uncomfortable. He started to favor his right foot. He asked whether he could sit down for a moment, and he had the trainer come and examine him. And sure enough, it was announced that he had a stress fracture in his right foot, and he couldn't go on. He had to forfeit the game, and number 87 was the victor over number four. Of course it was fishy. Two weeks later, Davidenko was playing in the U.S. Open and he made it all the way through to the quarterfinals. Some stress fracture. I think it was two weeks later, a short time later. But you know something? 
Mr. Bell saw what was going on and he said, as a gambler, it's my job to make money. I'm about to make money because this is a sure thing. It didn't look like a sure thing. Number four against number 87 turned upside down. That's surely not a sure thing. Except looking at the signs, the irrefutable evidence, he said there's nothing surer than number four is going to lose the match. That's what happened. In gambling, we like a sure thing, don't we? Oh, wrong crowd. In gambling, I was expecting someone to say amen. <laughs> In gambling, gamblers love a sure thing. If there is such a thing. Before I became a Christian, I used to gamble an awful lot and used to bet on the racehorses a lot and we'd play cards and gamble money and it soon became clear that what we thought was a sure thing often wasn't a sure thing. Let me tell you about a sure thing. I'll, uh, I'll preface this by saying this. I don't know if you ever heard of the movie Invictus. I don't watch a lot of movies, but uh, I was told there's a movie called Invictus, and I heard about it at the time. It's the story of South Africa as told uh, in the context of the 1995 Rugby World Cup. Now, I'm from New Zealand where we play rugby. Now, I've never ever said this before, but in New Zealand we say rugby is like American football, but for real men. That's the first time I ever said that. Yeah, first time today. Hey, man, that's right. Rugby is our national sport. We won the inaugural Rugby World Cup in 1987. New Zealand has forever been the world's premier rugby nation. So we think whenever we go to a Rugby World Cup, it's a sure thing. This uh, movie Invictus was about South Africa. Just after apartheid, the Rugby World Cup came to South Africa. When apartheid ended, people thought that all hell was going to break loose in South Africa. And the black majority, which had been oppressed under apartheid, people felt sure was going to spill white blood in the streets of South Africa. Except that South Africa had a remarkable man as president. His name was Nelson Mandela. And Nelson Mandela did all he could to keep the country together. During the 1995 World Cup, he wore uh, a, the green Springbok South African rugby jersey. He wore the South African rugby cap. Rugby's a white man's game, at least it was. That's the perception. Here's the black president uh, posing as a rugby supporter, even player, if you know what I mean. He was bringing the country together, and it was a great struggle and so on. Well, you know, we were sure New Zealand was going to win the final of the Rugby World Cup. New Zealand made the final. New Zealand was playing against South Africa. They made a movie about this. There's one thing wrong, and that is that New Zealand didn't win the Rugby World Cup. Yeah, oops. I've had people say to me, hey, you need to watch this movie. No, I don't. If it was the last movie on earth, I would not watch it. If somebody said, you're going to die right now, or in two hours, if you take that two hours and watch Invictus, I would say, just put me out right now. I don't even want those extra two hours. I know how it ends. It ends badly. It was a sure thing that we were going to win the 1995 Rugby World Cup. We didn't. Now, we did win two years ago in 2011. So, you know, I, I don't know what that's got to do with anything, but I felt compelled just to toss that out there. You like a sure thing. We like can't lose investments. We like that. One reason a lot of people lost their shirt during the housing crisis, one reason is that a lot of people kept on investing in the housing market because you can't lose in real estate. Well, sometimes even sure things are not such sure thing. You know, we have been called to be involved in God's work. The work of the church is to reach out to the world to win the world to Jesus Christ. If you can win the whole world, go and do it. If you can win only one, take the one. But we are called by God to be active in soul winning and evangelism. Can you say amen? 
Now, here's what's interesting. Every so often, a new method comes out. Oh, you've got to try this witnessing tool. You've got to try this seminar. Use this brochure. Use this tract. Say this in a conversation. Now, I've never, ever heard anybody say, here's the cannot fail method of soul winning and evangelism. But boy, I wish there was one. Wouldn't it just be great if you knew you could buy this or use that or, or say this or play that or preach this or sing that and you knew there was a guarantee to, that, that people were going to come to Jesus, flock to Christ like, you know, lemmings uh, together running off a... Oh, that's not a good analogy, but... If you knew there was a sure thing in soul winning. If I just do this, there's no doubt that a person would be converted. That'd be good. Well, I want to say to you that in the Bible, God tells us that there is a sure thing. Turn with me in your Bible to Psalm 126. Psalm 126. Let's look there. Uh, the Psalms are songs, you understand, and this one is a song of ascent. Probably wasn't written by David certainly was inspired by the Holy Spirit, no question. These songs of ascent were sung, they say, when the worshipers went up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was up. And they would go up to Jerusalem to keep the certain feast days. And this one begins with the worshipers singing, When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dreamed. The experts say it's most likely not referring to the Babylonian captivity, but to any sort of oppression or tyranny or burden or captivity of any kind. The key thought is this. The Lord turned the captivity. Now, I want you to entertain the idea that God can turn captivity. Did you know that? Literally, Joseph went to prison. God worked it out. Joseph came out. James went to prison and lost his head. Peter went to prison, and he was released, escorted from the prison by an angel of God. God is able to do that, not just for others, but for you too. And I'm not talking literal prison, but if there's something you are caught by, stuck in, in your life, you've got to be able to believe that God is able to turn your captivity. Press the throne of grace. Pray the big prayers. Expect that God is working. Know that God is on your side. If you read about Christ, your high priest, you find that in the book of Hebrews, it says that Jesus appears in the presence of God for us. You ought to say hallelujah. There is a heaven. Jesus is there, and he is on your side. Good news, I say. Verse 2 says this. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongues with singing. You know, ladies and gentlemen, there was a lady standing right about here a few moments ago, and she said that uh, she said words to the effect that if you're happy, uh, it ought to be visible. You know, we're singing praises to God, and sometimes we look like tombstones, even though the words we're singing is, Jesus is coming again. Huh? You ought to be able to smile about that. God is going to forgive my sin. No, you ought to be able to get up about that, you know. And you don't want to look like you've taken too much medication whenever you come to church. You don't, to, you don't need to act crazy. But ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says, Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing of all people. God's people ought to be characterized by the joy that comes from knowing that God has turned our captivity. Thank God. You know what's going to happen one day? You're going to look out the window. You're going to say, whoa, is that a tornado? N n wait a minute. I see a cloud that about half the size of a man's hand coming. Is it really? And Jesus is coming back. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to get mighty Pentecostal right about then. Yes, you are. It's Jesus. Did you see that lady doing that in church? Well, now you're doing it. It's Jesus. Huh? You're going to be shouting that day. Now, I'm not trying to tell you you need to shout, do handstands, anything like that. You do whatever you want. But man, be happy because you got something to be happy about. Jesus is coming back. Sin, you know what sin going to do? It's going to kill you, not just in this world, but eternally. There is a death sentence hanging over your head. I have friends on death row. I think I can call them friends. Death row. I was the pastor of a church, and that church had on its church books 
this country's most notorious, or should I say most prolific, serial killer. Did you know that? The man in the United States who's killed more people than anybody else is a Seventh-day Adventist? Wait, hang on. We don't know whether they praise the Lord or, oh man. He became a Seventh-day Adventist as the result of Seventh-day Adventist prison ministries. Praise the Lord. Well, he doesn't have a death sentence hanging over his head. He has a life imprisonment hanging over his head. There's another fellow in that prison. He's also an Adventist. He killed, oh, relatively few people comparatively. But he is on death row. And uh, he said to me, I feel terrible about the crimes that I committed. He's, he, he, he knows he did what he did, and he's not trying to hide that. But he said, he said, even through his tears, I can tell you that I'm thankful today for the freedom that I have in Jesus. Be a cynic if you wish. Call it a jailhouse conversion if you wish. But when you see me walking with that brother along a street of gold one day, I expect you to say hallelujah. Now, if this man found out there's an appeals process going on and so on, if he found out that they had pulled the death sentence and commuted that perhaps and given him life instead, he would be saying, thank you, Jesus. He would be happy. Ladies and gentlemen, when Jesus stepped into our life, the death sentence was commuted. It wasn't just changed to life in prison. Let me not say it was commuted. It was rescinded. And in the place of the sentence of death, God gave us the sentence of life. We've got something to be glad about today. Glad man. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. What do the heathen say about you? Well, if they've been reading the news lately, they know that you're probably going to live a little longer than everybody else because Adventist health study was just in the news the other day. That's good. They probably say, Well, that's my neighbor doesn't eat meat. All right, that's fine. That's my neighbor won't drink coffee, although that's going out the window for some strange reason. That my neighbor won't drink liquor. That's my neighbor who won't do anything on Saturday but go to church. Well, that's all right. But if your neighbor only knows you for the things you don't do, that's not enough. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord has done great things for them. How awesome would it be if the people in your town said, Adventists, I can tell you this, the Lord has done great things for them. Don't you think it's fair to say that if we've really been redeemed, and if we really have Christ, and if we're really one day going to live on the edge of a street made out of gold, in a mansion prepared by Jesus himself, shouldn't that shine out of our lives? Shouldn't somebody be able to say, I don't know everything about that person, but it is evident the Lord has done great things for them. You ought to have a testimony. You ought to be one. Look for opportunities to say, God has blessed me. Let somebody give the glory to God when they say, God has done something great for that person. Thank the Lord. I appeal to you. If you claim Jesus as your own, let it be seen. Let your colleagues know. Somebody told me early on tonight about a conversation that this individual had had with an old friend. And the old friend said, I knew what you were about back then. It was seen in the life. Praise the Lord. Revelation 18 says this. Did you ever read it? It says the whole world will be filled with a manifestation of the glory of God. The world was lit up with the glory of God. And you know what that is? That's the character of Christ manifest in God's people. Ain't that something? God is going to light up this darkened world with a manifestation of himself in you. And people will be saying then, the Lord has done great things to them. Verse 3, the Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. I can just imagine the Israelites singing this on their way to Jerusalem. The Lord has done great things for us. We're so glad about it, we're going to sing about it. But let's move on because we're going to get to the business end of the psalm, the part of the psalm that really fits like a hand in a glove with our camp meeting theme this year. Verse 4, turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. And here we go, verse 5. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. 
Now, somebody wrote that this represents the Jewish farmers sowing their last grain with tears, but knowing that the casting away of their precious resource would result in a great harvest. But as you look at this verse through the lens of our mission on this planet, our responsibility, can I use that word, as God's end time people, we see that there's an application for us, an application that speaks to the fact that God wants us to reach this sinful, lost, dying world for Him. God is speaking to us. Verse 5 is spelled out in verse 6. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Let's break that down. He that goeth forth. What's God telling us here? He's telling us that we are to go forth. It's old news, really, particularly as we've uh, iterated and reiterated this across the weekend. I hope I'm preaching to the choir. In the Great Commission, Jesus says, Go ye and teach all nations or make disciples of all nations. Jesus said, Go. Jesus said, The harvest is great. Imagine a farmer around here, some corn a corn grower in Iowa with an enormous field filled with corn. And the guy who drives the combine harvester says, I cannot make it today. And you call a second cab on the rank and he says, I can't make it either. And you call a third and you discover that nobody's going to come driving through your field harvesting that corn. What are you going to say? The harvest truly is great, but the what? Labor is a few. You're going to be desperate now. You're going to be scrambling, calling your neighbors, calling your friends, calling your family. Please, you must come and help. I've got a crop standing in the field. It must be harvested. If we don't harvest this thing, it will all be wasted and I will suffer great loss. Imagine, friend, how God feels. He looks on the fields white and ready to harvest. He's calling, come to the harvest, come to the harvest. There is a, a field that must be reaped. If it is not reaped, all will be wasted and I will suffer great loss. God says the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. If God has been speaking to you about this, then you ought to, you, you, you got to get out of whatever you're doing and go work with God in the harvest. I talked to a brother earlier. He's a pastor here now. He said, a few years ago, God called me. I just left what I was doing, and I went off and got some evangelism training. You know, I did not mention to you that It Is Written now runs an evangelism training school called SALT. There are several evangelism training schools. I'm thankful for every one of them. SALT is yet another. It's a fabulous school. People go there, and they are equipped and trained. They come out of there and do something great for Jesus. If you can't go get training, don't go. But if you can, go be trained. If you can't go there, talk to the pastor. Pastor, you must train me. Go to a late training seminar that the conference turns on or somebody is turning on. If God is prodding you to step out of your comfort zone. What's the name of that missionary who went to China? Was that William Carey? Who was the great missionary to China? I'm asking you, the doctor. I'm asking you because I forget. We were reading about him just the other night. I'm getting older, you understand. That's it, Hudson Taylor. I knew that, of course. I was just testing you. Hudson Taylor, if Hudson Taylor hadn't stepped out of his comfort zone, that the gospel wouldn't have been taken to the Chinese way back there. And you know what he decided? He said that the mission society won't send people, so I'm going to recruit them, and I'll raise the money, and I'll get people over there. And then he realized, hang on a minute, people go to China and catch diseases and die. Die. And so if I call them and send them and they die, their blood is on my hands. And he thought about it and he said, well, what would be wrong with that? If they spend their life literally trying to win a soul for Jesus in China, that's the best thing they could do. Better to die winning a soul than live sitting on your hands. Hmm? Friend, if we just waited till it was convenient to send missionaries here and there. I, I, I talked today to a friend and her brother and I can't get too specific, you'll know who I'm talking about, has been in the Middle, not the Middle East, the Far East for 15 or so years. Comes back once a year, doesn't see the kids much. Don't, they don't see the grandchildren. But they are not consulting their personal comfort. They are simply saying, God called us, and so we went. No, I'm not, this is not a recruit for foreign missions, necessarily. 
Well, this is a recruitment drive for missions. And if God calls you to Madagascar, go. If God calls you to Burma, Myanmar, go. If God calls you to North Dakota, go there. And if God calls you to be a missionary in Mobley or Macon or Joplin or Council Bluffs or someplace like that, be there. If God has called you to be a missionary on your street, in your workplace, in your family, if it means getting out of your comfort zone just a little bit, by all means, get out of that comfort zone. Gospel isn't going to be finished in comfort, you understand. Friends, time to go. Time to go and be active working for Jesus. He that goeth forth. God's looking for somebody who will go forth. God's looking for somebody who will take a risk. God is looking for somebody who will trade comfort for discomfort and certainty for unpredictability. He that goes forth and weepeth. Just last year I happened to be in Papua New Guinea. I had never been before. It is a beautiful country. It is a stark country filled with gracious people. It is written had a humanitarian project there before we started Eyes for India and we were distributing the Bible in audio form, recorded Bibles. We called them God pods and people there who could not read received the Bible in audio form. They quickly learned how to use this uh, solar powered device and they would listen to the Bible in their own language. And there were steps to Christ and there were Bible studies and health talks and children's stories all on the God pod. I went to a village. What a beautiful village. There was a church here, but over here there was a bigger church being built because the little church wasn't big enough anymore. I went into that little church and, uh, and uh, the, my friends said, come with me, come up the front here. I went up the front and on the communion table was a basket, the offering basket, with yesterday's offering still in it. The church didn't even have a door. They didn't leave it in there because it was secure. They left it in there because nobody was going to steal it. It was a beautiful village. They had seventh-day pigs. Now, the other people had pigs, but they know the Adventists because they have goats instead of pigs. They call them seventh-day pigs. Goats. Beautiful flowers growing. The grass cut. I'm like, where is the lawnmower? No lawnmower. They're down there with a scythe cutting that grass. Beautiful. You'd go, what a nice place, and you would want to stay. I ate the most magnificent pineapple I've ever eaten in my life. Fabulous place. Now, 50 years ago, a New Zealander, his name was Len Barnard, Pastor Len Barnard, went to Papua New Guinea. He flew a plane, you know. And he flew in there and he said, I'm going to take the gospel to these people. They said, Len, you can't do that. Why is that? They're cannibals. And, and they'll have you over for dinner. Well, if I don't go, they'll always be cannibals. If I go, I can share Jesus with them and maybe he will change their hearts. Len, don't go. See you later. And he went. They were cannibals, all right. He took the gospel. He took medicine. Medicine and the gospel. Oh, let's hear it for medical missionary work. He was a true medical missionary. He took medicine and he took the gospel and he taught people how to be well and look after themselves. You know, when he went there, the people were in terrible fear. They lived in fear. They trusted nobody. They had not friends but enemies only outside the village. They were sick. And they were sick because they were cannibals. I mean, real cannibals. When somebody died... Pastor Barnard said, we'll have a funeral tomorrow. He had to sit up all night with the body to make sure nobody stole the body and took it away and ate it. If you were the strong man of the village and you died, now they would eat you so that they would get your strength in them. And they weren't eating the healthy. They didn't have any concept of disease. If somebody died diseased, they'd eat the person. And you know what they're doing, they're just eating disease terribly terribly sick pastor Barnard said I'm going and he went and he shared Jesus and I was in one of those very villages 50 years later the one I just described they were eating people 50 years ago now if you're as the as same age as this young fellow down here no pastor Kleindienst I don't mean you I mean the young fella down here then he's gonna say 50 years that's that's not much shorter than like a thousand years right 
But for many of the rest of us, we say 50 years ago, that was just yesterday. So just yesterday, these people are eating each other. Today, what are they doing? They're healthy. There's no disease. They got rid of the cannibalism. They're living clean lives. The villages are clean. The pigs are gone. The pigs used to just wander through the village and make a, you can understand, make a mess. They don't have enemies anymore. They live in peace. They're not living in fear, except for perhaps fear God and give glory to Him. Huh? You've got brothers and sisters in Jesus right now, 50 years removed from having, eating, uh, having eaten their brothers and sisters. And the reason is because somebody answered God's call to go. Now, if God calls you to Papua New Guinea, go. But if He calls you simply to be a witness in your neighborhood, go there too. God needs people all over the place. Now, did it cost Pastor Barnard anything? No, it didn't cost him anything. Well, he did, he did get his leg chopped off. But other than that, it didn't cost him anything. He got a little too close to the propeller of an aircraft. The propeller was spinning around. It hit his leg. Doom. They said, all right, Len, we've got to get you to the hospital. He said, oh, all right. He said, where's my leg? They said, your leg, your leg's in, in shreds, man. Forget that. He said, no, bring my leg. Bring the leg? Yeah, they'll put it on back at the hospital. Pastor, no, <laughs> no, there's no way. Bring the leg. No, no, it, it can't happen. He said, let's let God decide if he wants me to walk again. All right, so they gather up the old mangled leg. They take it not to Loma Linda University Medical Center, but to the local Bush Hospital in Papua New Guinea. They patch him up a little bit, and then they send him to Australia, the largest nearby country. They took one look at him in the leg, and they said, Oh, you can't be serious. And he said, I'm as serious as a heart attack because I believe in a powerful God. And if God wants me to walk, I'll walk. If you went to Kurenbong, New South Wales, an hour and a half north of Sydney in Australia, that's where Avondale College is, and you went to one of the retirement homes there, you could meet Len Barnard, and if you saw him walking, you'd notice that he walks with a slight limp because that leg that was impossible to save was saved by God got it back and carried on in ministry, God does the impossible. Let me hear you say amen. God does the impossible. He that goes forth, the world will not be won while we hang back. But look at what the text says. He that goeth forth and weepeth. There's got to be something in you that responds to the great need of humanity. Let me come at this from a couple of angles, just quickly. We weep because we are burdened for souls. We want people to know Jesus. And we weep because we recognize our insufficiency. We realize that we are not up to the task. Nobody ever won a soul. Nobody. Only the Holy Spirit ever won a soul. We just make ourselves available to God that He might use us somehow. And you know something? You might only ever be a link in the chain. Did you ever read that story in Mark chapter 2? There was a paralyzed man, and four people carried him to Jesus. This is the guy that ended up taking him up on the roof and letting him down because all of the believers were getting in the way. He was carried by four. We don't know their names. I don't know whether these were outstanding individuals or not, but what they could do was carry a man, at least a quarter of a man. Four joined together and the man was carried to Jesus. We just make ourselves available to God. That's all. Do you know one of the problems we've got? We've got a problem, and that is that the church is barely alive in some places. And I'll tell you why. If you want to know the secret to reviving a church, I'm about to tell you. And I've got this on good authority. I got this out of a book that you'll appreciate, I think. It's called The Desire of Ages. And in that book, here's what it says. It says, the very life of the church depends upon. You want to know? The very life of the church depends upon her faithfulness in fulfilling the Lord's commission. So if you've got a dead church, stop complaining about the pastor. Get off your backside and go and do something for Jesus. That's what the life of the church depends upon. Her faithfulness in fulfilling the Lord's commission. 
To neglect this work is surely to invite spiritual feebleness and decay. Listen, where there is no active labor for others, love wanes and faith grows dim. Have you never heard it said that the best thing you can do if you are in a funk is get busy serving somebody else? You will be caused to see your problems in perspective and you may even forget about them while you're helping somebody else. Now, if you go and work for a soul, oh, John, I don't know what to do. Well, I don't know what to do either. But you pray to God and God will show you what to do. I don't know how to reach my mother. I tell you, I don't know how to reach mine. I don't know. But I pray every day and you chip away and you make yourself available and you say, God, if there's something you want me to do, I'm trusting that you are going to show me. Hmm? You just make yourself available to God. Let the Spirit of God get a hold of you. Remember, the Spirit of God is not a tool that you use like wielding a hammer. You are a tool that the Spirit of God uses. If you let God do it, He will use you for His glory. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. We were holding a series of meetings in a large city. Bible study enrollment cards had gone out and people sent them back and you know what they say on those Bible study enrollment cards please bring me Bible studies it can't get much easier than that a couple went to an address they discovered to their chagrin it was in a gated community they said well we can't get in they tried again gate was still down they came back to church one night they said we tried North side of town, can't get in, this is, we're done. Well, there was a couple who said, north side of town? That's not too far from our church, let's go. And so they went. They went to the house, they saw it was a gate, not a gate with a Rottweiler and a man with a gun, not that kind of gate, just one of these little old bars that come up and down. And you know, you know how to get into a gated community, right? Just wait. Someone's going to drive out. You drive in. If you live in a gated community, I'm really sorry. I just said that. I mean. <laughs> in they went. They went to the address. Knock, 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 knock. Huh, he's not home. We'll come back. They came back a second time. He was not home. They came back a third time. He was not home. How many times would you have gone back? They went back a fourth time, mm -mm, not there. They're standing on the doorstep fifth time. Guess what happened? He wasn't home. They came back the sixth time, still not there. They came back a seventh time, knocked on the door and waited. There was no light on. There was no car in the driveway. They looked at each other. They said, how many times? We're going to have to come back here. Just as they were thinking of walking away, the door opened. And they said, you sure are a hard man to find at home. They told him, told him while they, why they were there, left two Bible studies, arranged to come back in a week, pick up the two, drop off another two, and they left. A week later, they were back. They did the exchange. They did that a third time. And about the fourth or fifth time they visited the man, he said, you know, wait, I do have a couple of questions about what I'm learning here. I wonder if you all wouldn't mind stepping inside and talking to me about some of this. When I got to town to preach the evangelistic series, I eventually met the man. He had a question for me. The question was, should I be rebaptized or should I join the Adventist church by profession of faith? Did you hear me? That was his question. That was his question. He said he was not as young as he'd once been, but he wasn't a very old man. But he said, now I know why God has kept me alive this long. He has spared my life just long enough so that I could learn the truth. Praise the Lord. He that goeth forth and weepeth. Sometimes you got to weep just a little bit. Literally or metaphorically. Seven trips back to the north side of town. 
seven times waiting to get through that gate, seven times knocking on a door, and then repeated visits so that they could take Bible studies to the man. Oh, friend, God's given us a powerful message. It's the three angels' messages. It's the message that says, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the seas and the fountains of waters. It's the one that goes on to say Babylon is fallen. It's the one that goes on to say if anyone receives the mark of the beast, that person cannot be saved. What a wonderful message. You know what it boils down to? It boils down to justification by faith in Jesus Christ. That's what the third angel's message is all about. It's about Christ. Judgment hour, all about Christ. Babylon, follow Christ. Mark of the beast, lean on Christ. Jesus is everywhere in the three angels messages and what a wonderful message that we have to share you know when we start to lose our way we start to lose our way when we lose our focus on what our message for the world really is we've been called by God to call out a remnant not just to be another church on the street there's power in the Word of God and notice it's only the one who goes forth bearing precious seed that comes to He that goes forth and weeps bearing precious seed. The seed is the Word of God. The seed isn't what you think. The seed isn't what rubs your fur the right way. The seed isn't what naturally appeals to you. The seed is God's Word. We got a message to take to the world. No time to shrink back. Take it. And as we do, we come again rejoicing. Didn't you ever read in Isaiah chapter 55? God's word will not return to him void, but it will prosper in the thing that God sends it to and it will accomplish that which, it, that which ple he pleases. There is power in the word of God. He that goes forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed. Now notice this voice. Sorry, this verse, this word. Notice whatever you want. He that goes forth and weeps, bearing precious seed shall what's that next word doubtless you want a sure thing you want number four losing to number 87 here it is he that goes forth and weeps bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing bringing his sheaves with him don't you like this if we go forward bearing and obviously sharing precious seed god says undoubtedly you will come again with rejoicing bringing your sheaves with you. Isn't that something? Now that doesn't mean, ladies and gentlemen, that you will necessarily ever see somebody baptized. I spoke last week or a couple of weeks ago someplace. A lady said, John, what do I do? In my neighborhood, they're all Christians already and they don't want to know what we believe. And I'm just sharing and sharing and sharing, but I don't seem to be, to be breaking through. Here's what we know about planting seed. When you put the corn seed in the ground and you step back and look, you don't see anything. And a day later, if you left it to appearances, you would say the seed was a waste. Depending on what variety of seed or what sort of plant it is, you might even say a week later, I put the seed in the ground and I don't see anything. But what you don't see is that there's something taking place under the ground. Germination is taking place. That little thing is starting to send out roots downwards and it's starting to send out a sprout upwards. And sure enough, you're going to look one day and say, wait, do I see a little ribbon of green there? Yes, I do. Well, it's, 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 it's not a redwood tree yet, but it's starting to grow. It is starting to grow. And then under the right circumstances, that thing is going to grow. There will be a harvest. You will one day come again with rejoicing bringing your sheaves with you doubtless God says if you do it results are guaranteed think of the amount of resources literature evangelists have left behind in homes they don't hardly hear uh, relatively much of the success of what takes place a friend of mine he was climbing around in the attic of his home in Washington DC once he came across a book. It was a book about Bible questions and answers. He said, what in the world is this? He took it down. He started to read this book. It was called Bible Readings for the Home. He said, Mother, where did this book come from? 
Oh, that old thing, I never even did read it. Man came by the house selling books. I liked the idea of that one. I bought that book, but read it if you want. He read the book. And today he is a professor in one of our universities. Amen. The old Cole Porter never knew, probably doesn't know, probably dead by now, might find out in heaven. Well, I shouldn't say might. I'm certain that he will. There's no doubt. You know, if you read in the book, Ministry of Healing, you will read this. We are to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice, accompanied by the power of persuasion, the power of prayer, the power of the love of God. This work will not, cannot be without fruit. Amen. Somebody met me out there in the parking lot, they said. Uh, there's a fellow who kind of ribs us Adventists. And he said something, and I said, well, you ever, you, uh, what did he say, you ever, uh, you ever read the Bible? Well, that's not an offensive question, man. You ever read the Bible? Oh, I, I poke around a bit on the internet, <laughs> pulled out this every word card from it is written. Well, take a look at this. Just take you one minute. Has he done it yet? What's going to happen? I don't know, and I don't know. But if you carry precious seed around with you and you look for opportunities to sow the seed and you cast the seed as God says cast the seed, you will doubtless come again with rejoicing bringing your sheaves with you. I have a brother who can't help himself. He's always looking for people to share Jesus with. Started taking the bus to work and he said, Lord, I'm going to get on this bus and look for somebody to witness to. I want a Bible study on that bus. Gets on a bus and sits down. Good morning. <laughs> well, it's not going to be that person. The next day he says, I won't sit there. That didn't work. I'll sit here. Good morning. <laughs> well, that didn't go anywhere. He, he tried and he tried and he sat down. Good morning. Oh, good morning. How you doing? Well, let's see what happens here. Every morning my brother and this guy would ride the bus together. And my brother is praying, Lord, I'm looking for a way through. Lord, what do I do? Lord, help me to see the opportunity. One day, they are talking on the bus, and the seat, my brother's seatmate says, you know, I was watching a television program last night. It was about the universe and the stars and the planets and all of that out there. Oh, he said it was fantastic. My brother, my brother said, did you ever wonder who made all that? And the guy said, he put his hands up, he goes, yes. I have wondered. The door was now wide open. And my brother became friends with that man and studied the Bible with that man and led that man to faith in Jesus Christ. Tell God you're willing. Tell God when a day starts, Lord, I would like to share Jesus with somebody somehow today. If you can arrange it. God isn't hard up to find, for, for people to save. He's hard up to find people to go do the saving. Amen. Harvest is great. Labor is a few. If you will say, God, I'm praying for a divine appointment today. Bring me in touch with somebody who needs what I know. You can even pray if you are shy and retiring. Lord, make it easy for me. If you're not shy and retiring, pray, Lord, give me wisdom. You know. Some of us need to pray for boldness to open our mouths, and some of us need to pray for wisdom to close our mouths. You know. But say to the Lord, I'm here, Lord. I remember being in a supermarket. I was in a town holding an evangelistic series. Where was it? Was it Missouri? I don't remember. It doesn't really matter. And I'm in a supermarket, and we're buying water. I'm buying water. And I've got these plastic water jugs, and I'm taking them up to the water machine, you know press the button it fills up your, your water jug and there's a man standing behind me and I looked at him and I knew that he was that he oh, I've got to say this in an appropriate way I knew that he was planning to say something to me I could just tell so we're standing there and he just starts talking to me about I don't know what the weather or whatever and after a while he started talking about his church and then he said you know what I would love to invite you to come out to my church this Wednesday night we've got this and this and this going on and I would just be honored if you'd be my guest at church this week a perf well an imperfect stranger he didn't know me from Adam and yet he moved on the impulse of God to share his faith and invite somebody to come to know Jesus 
God bless the man, huh? God bless him. You know, have you ever heard of this entertainment duo, Penn and Teller? Have you ever heard of them? I think they're magicians in Las Vegas. I don't know much about them. One of them is a, is a big-time atheist. Penn Gillette, the big guy with the ponytail. He said this, I heard it with my own ears and saw it with my own eyes. He, he talked about Christians who believe that they've got the truth. And he, dis, and he discussed a man who came to his show, met him outside the theater, and gave him a Bible. This guy's the biggest atheist in the world just about. Gave him a Bible. And then he gave him, he said, and, and if you have any questions, please call me. Here's my home number, my cell number, my office number, my fax number, my email address. Nine yards. Because if you have any questions, I'd be happy to follow up with you. Gillette said, he didn't say Christian scoundrel. He said, I admired that man. He said, if you believe in the afterlife, and you believe that the end is coming, he stopped, he said, if I saw a truck coming straight towards you, there would come a time that I would just have to tackle you out of the way of that truck. And then he said, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? An atheist said that. If you really believe that you've got the antidote for the poison of sin, what are you doing keeping the antidote in the cupboard, walking around town, talking about how sad it is that so many people are dying from the poison? How much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? He that goes forth and weeps, bearing precious seed, I love it, I love it, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing bringing his sheaves with him you might not see it but you can believe it somebody received a handbill to one of our evangelistic series in Tennessee and he was in a mall 40 45 miles away from if, I don't know what he was doing with the thing in the mall or even if it was a he but that individual threw the handbill in the trash the man who worked at the mall as the janitor emptied that trash bin. And as he was emptying the trash bin, he saw something colorful. He, what was that? And he fished it out. Bible prophecy seminar. I've got to tell my wife about this. She said, yes, I do. They went, and yes, they were. Both of them baptized, part of God's end time church. And we might have saw somebody, we might have seen somebody throw that handbill away and says, well, that was a waste. But it's never a waste when God's Spirit is at work. Can you say amen? It's never a waste. He that goes forth and weeps, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. I was talking to my friend Ron Halverson yesterday. He told me this wonderful story. He once told me about a, a time an evangelist held a series of meetings in a big city. And they spent a ton of money on it. And when all was said and done, there were about six people baptized. The evangelist, a well-known evangelist, just felt like dying. Oh, I know, we praise the Lord for six, that's right. But if you're an evangelist and you spend that kind of money, you're not thinking about the six nearly as much as you're thinking about the money. <laughs> it's just, you say, Lord, six, I'm thinking 600. Six. Helverson knew about this. He knew who the man was. Years later, at a camp meeting, the speakers all backstage. There were three speakers, and I don't know what they were doing back there. He did explain it. Helverson and another guy and that evangelist. And Pastor Helverson went up to that man. He said, Elder, 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 I heard you held some meetings in New York City way back in whatever year that was. The, 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 eva the old evangelist melted, you know, shrunk back. Oh, yeah, mm, yeah, sure, that, you know, that wasn't a great meeting. I heard you had 
12,000 baptisms in that meeting. No, 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 elder. No, we baptize just a few. No, no. The way I see it, you baptize 12,000. Come on, don't do this to me. That was a really difficult experience. And Elder Halverson said, Elder, let me tell you something. There was a young fellow who came to that meeting, a woman who came to that meeting, and she was baptized. Her son was one of my best friends. He led me to Jesus, and I was baptized. And in my ministry, I have seen 12,000 people baptized. He said, Elder, I understand you had 12,000 baptisms in that meeting. The old evangelist wept. Thank you, brother. Thank you for telling me. Thank you. If you go forward bearing precious seed, come on now, leave it to God. He will bring the result doubtless. Friend, I'm not promising you that your cousin is ever going to be baptized. I'm not promising you that. But I am promising you that if you go forward bearing precious seed, you will doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing your sheaves with you. God has said so. This is no time to shrink back from the work of soul winning and evangelism. This is the time to say, thank God I'm in this vineyard where we believe in that stuff. Public meetings, personal evangelism, literature distribution, friendship evangelism. I mean, you name it. You, whatever it is, if it's evangelism. And no, 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 no. I am not saying, well, you just be a good Christian and hope that somebody notices you. Uh-uh. No one ever went fishing with a shiny new fishing pole and cast that thing out there and just hoped that the fish would notice how new the hook was and they'd go and get snagged on it. Tie some pretty lure on there, right? Put bait on the hook, right? That's right. You got to bait the hook, man, and when they bite, psh, do some of this psh, and start reeling them in for Jesus. Jesus will do the reeling. He just wants to do it through you. Don't say, oh, I just go to work and mind my business and hope they come to me and ask. They're going to die without ever asking you. Pray that you can find a reason to tell, a way to tell. Pray that God would put a, a, a burden on them to open up their hearts or their lives or their minds or their mouths to you in some way. Pray that God would open up for you a door of utterance. We're almost there, ladies and gentlemen. We're almost home. And God says that if we go forth bearing precious seed, we will doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing our sheaves with him. Now you know that there is such a thing as a sure thing. And that's spreading the seed, casting the seed of the Word of God. And one day you're going to get to heaven and somebody you don't know is going to say, thank you. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. What for? Well, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was your kind word. It was your book. It was your invitation. Whatever it might have been. It was your praying. It was your willingness. It was your evangelistic meeting. Yeah, but we didn't baptize anybody. Oh, no, no. We stopped coming after night four because on day five we left town. But when we moved to another state, we found the Adventist church and we went there and we were baptized. Never did tell you. Sorry about that. And you will say, praise the Lord. What a day it's going to be. One day Jesus coming back. We, I don't think we'll look down, but if we did, we'll see the earth get smaller. Instead of looking down, we're going to look up. And all around us on that great journey through the cosmos will be people who have come to Christ because people did something to bring them to Christ. Can you be that person? No, no, wait. You can be that person. Make yourself willing. God will use you for his glory pray with me now father in heaven tonight we are grateful that we can be yours and in your service tonight we are thankful that you have given to us the precious seed of the word of God friend can I appeal to you for a moment listen now our heads are bowed our eyes are closed I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in just a moment if you don't want to raise your hand, then don't. No one's going to know. The person sitting beside you won't even hear it. And no one's going to be looking around. 
But would you say to God, Lord, I'm willing to be used? That's all. Don't make a promise. Don't look at your inadequacy. Can you say, Lord, I'm willing to be used for your glory if you'll use me? That's all. If you can say that to God, please raise your hand. Lord, I'm willing to be used. No, no, I'm not asking you, will you go to Siberia? I'm not asking you if you'll sell all you have and give the money to evangelism. I'm not, I'm, I'm, we might ask you that next year, but right now I'm not asking you that. I'm not asking you if you'll go here or there or anywhere, but if you will say, God, I am willing to be used by you to reach somebody with the gospel. Please lift up your hand. Please lift it up. God will use you. He wants to use you. God will do the work. You'll be the vessel. Father, here we are. And we're going to go from this place certain, Lord, certain, believing, Lord, that you have a great work for us to do collectively and for all of us to do individually. Now bless us that the gospel will go and that people will turn to you and that Jesus will soon return. We pray with grateful thanks in Jesus' name. Let God's people say together, Amen and Amen.